Walsh uses that in a couple of the songs he's written. It's so appropriate. There's really a sense in which we really can't and won't praise him. We won't breathe out his praise until we have breathed in his grace. Great to be with you today. Good to see all of you here. I don't know how many of you made it to Sunday morning Bible study. I won't ask. And I won't even ask how many of you came in thinking you were coming to Bible study and realized that worship service was about to begin. But you're here. That's the main thing. And we're glad you're here. Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. We're going to read today verses 17 to 31. We won't get through this whole passage. This is going to be a, a two-part message. So I'll tell you that so that you won't be alarmed when I read you the outline of it, which has 11 points in it. We're not going to try to get through all those today. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. We're going to think today about the deadly lie of works righteousness. If it doesn't connect with you, I mean, it's, it's the deadly lie of, of thinking you can be saved by your works, by your good works, by your goodness, by something that you do or haven't done. If you found Mark 10, 17 to 31 in your Bibles, and I much prefer for you to look in your Bible. If you don't have one, however, we're going to put this on the screens for you, and I want to ask you to see me after the service. We'll do what we can to put a Bible in your hands. Stand with me if you would, and follow along as I read these verses from the English Standard Version. And as he, that is Jesus, as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. What have we just read? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We've got to get this right. Many have gotten it wrong to their own peril. Thank you. Be seated. It's been rightly said that when you distill man's relationship to God and the manner in which that comes to pass, when you distill it down to its essence, there are only two religious worldviews. There are many world religions, many subdivisions under that, but there are only two religious worldviews, and only one of these is true. One is man discovering a way to reach God. The other is God 
reaching man. Another way to state these is this. Man experiencing a relationship with God based on his, that is man's, righteous works. Or God inviting man into a relationship with him on the basis of a righteousness outside of or alien to man. Every world religion, cult, and non-Christian sect falls into the first category. Man coming up with a way to reach God. Biblical Christianity, I've determined to steer away from evangelical Christianity since this election cycle has demonstrated beyond question that the term evangelical has lost all resemblance in its original meaning. So biblical Christianity is the only worldview that teaches that a person can only be made right with God by the grace of God shown to sinners upon the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ displayed in his sinless life of perfect obedience to the law of God and his sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing death whereby he satisfied the divine justice of God by suffering and dying in our place. I don't want you to miss this. I'm going to read this again. Now listen to me. It is only biblical Christianity. It's the only worldview that teaches that a person can only be made right with God by the grace of God shown to sinners upon the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ displayed in his sinless life. We call that his active obedience. His sinless life of perfect obedience to the law of God. And his sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing death, that's his passive obedience whereby he satisfied the divine justice of God by suffering and dying in our place. Now even when we speak of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we must understand that repentance and faith on the part of a sinner are grace gifts from God given to the sinner in the moment that the Holy Spirit brings that sinner to life in the new birth, enabling the sinner to repent and believe. It should be obvious that a religious worldview that teaches works righteousness as a way to have peace with God is deadly. Because it's wrong. It requires you to redefine everything, redefine sin, redefine the holiness of God. But I want to tell you, in Christian circles in the West, a, a very dangerous subdivision of that worldview it's one that claims to teach salvation by grace through faith as the only way to have peace with God. And it teaches that in theory, but it actually holds out and teaches a subtle form of works righteousness. I quoted from the old hymn last week, and I want to quote it again, and I appreciate everything that Josh led us in today. Every song focused on this, on the, the old hymn, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, come to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. It's salvation, as Jonah discovered, and we read earlier, salvation is of the Lord. As Paul said in Romans, for of him, through him, and unto him is all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. Now this passage here, in my understanding of it, breaks down under, under 11 thoughts. There's this first, a sincere inquiry. Second, a searching response. Third, a superficial response. Fourth, a sober challenge. Fifth, a sorrowful departure. Sixth, a serious assertion. Seventh, a stunned question. Eight, a salvific clarification. Nine, a selfish appeal. Ten, a soothing assurance. And then eleven, a spiritual paradox. We're just going to open this up today and, and move along, and I think I have an idea of how far we'll get before we break it off and continue it next Sunday, Lord willing. First, there's this sincere inquiry, and I want us to see it as that. This man is known as the rich young ruler because in the, in the passages in Matthew and Luke and Mark, which all three tell about this, uh, we're, we're told <clears throat> that he has great possessions. Jesus calls him a young man. We're told that he's a ruler. Jesus is setting out on his journey. Remember what he's just done. He's just showed them 
He's taught earlier, don't, don't offend one of these little children. He's just showed them that, th that children represent something of the childlikeness that's necessary to, to enter the kingdom. In fact, he's going to call them children in this passage later on. I think it's fascinating when he says to his disciples, children, to remind them the significance of childlikeness. But this, this fellow comes with a sincere inquiry. We're told Jesus is setting out, and this man runs up and kneels before him. That's a, that's a posture of, uh, of an inferior to a superior. He, he's acknowledging that Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher. He uses an adjective to describe him that Jesus uses to do some teaching with. And he says to him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now Matthew, in his account, captured this. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So when he's asking about inheriting eternal life, he's, he is asking on the basis of something he can do. And there's, there's a couple of things wrong here that you need to see. Jesus has, has just taught earlier about children who receive that the kingdom is something you receive as gift. This man is talking about inheriting as right. And he puts the emphasis not upon what God, what God has done or will do to open the doors of the kingdom, but upon what he can do. And that's classic works righteousness. Where we think that we have the right to have a relationship with God. And then we can make it come to pass on something we do. Well, let's give the man this. because He's being a good Jew here. We don't want to scold him. That's just what he learned in Judaism. Jesus understands where he is, and that's why he addresses him the way he does in the following verses. But let's give the man his due. It's a sincere inquiry. And folks, I would take somebody starting there rather than not inquiring at all. I would rather someone come to me and say, Pastor, what good deed do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Because at least they're thinking about eternity. And you have a conversation with someone who's thinking about eternity and their place in it. There's secondly a searching response. Jesus responds, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Matthew says it this way. Matthew 19, 17. Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And then Mark tells us, verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not murder. It's the sixth commandment. Do not commit adultery. Seventh commandment. Do not steal. Eighth commandment. Do not bear false witness. Ninth commandment. Do not defraud, a general principle coming out of the commandments. Honor your father and your mother. The fifth commandment. Now, if you know the Ten Commandments, you know that Jesus basically points out to this fellow that you need to have relationships that honor God. Based upon a relationship with God that you already have. The fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth commandments all speak to man's relationship to fellow man. I want you just to notice at this point, he did not cite the 10th commandment. Do not covet. There's a reason I think he didn't do that. So Jesus is asking him here, what are you saying about me? Good teacher. Good rabbi. Jesus says the term good only applies to one. And that is God. God. The implications of that being, young man, you're not good. You're not as good as you think you are. Now folks, I would tell you the path to salvation involves coming face to face with the reality, as Jesus taught in the Beatitudes, that we are poor in spirit. We're not as good as we think we are. In fact, it's people who think they're good, good enough, who don't have a sense of their need of Christ. They're not gripped with, with the need of, a, of blood shed for them. They're not, they're not gripped with the notion that, that they're lawbreakers and they need a law keeper. I told you my friend Fred Malone is a pastor friend of mine. He, he still serves at First Baptist Clinton. He followed me there and is still there. And great pastor, great teacher. 
He said the gospel can be summed up as God the law giver sending Christ the law keeper to die for lawbreakers. Jesus asked him a searching question. Why do you call me good? What are you saying about me? Because the man was not saying that he believed Jesus was divine. He was not saying that he believed Jesus was the Messiah. He was using the term to, to acknowledge that Jesus, the things that Jesus taught and did, reflected a good character in him. But Jesus uses it as an occasion to let him know that when it comes to talking about inheriting eternal life or being made right with God, that only God is good and all others in the equation are not. And if he was going to acknowledge Jesus as good, then he needed to acknowledge Jesus as God. You've run into these people I know who say, well, I don't, I don't believe Jesus was the Son of God, but I think he was a good man. Really? Really? Because he claimed to be the Son of God. Which if he wasn't, if you're right and he wasn't, then, then he lied. Good men don't lie. And I think it was Josh McDowell or someone like that who posited that Jesus was either Lord, liar, or lunatic. He was either lying about who he was as the Son of God, the Messiah, or he was insane. As his family suggested when they came one time and he was teaching, they said, uh, he, has a, he has a demon. Our, our brother has a demon about him. He's, he's, a, he's a lunatic. Jesus puts this man on the spot here. Why do you call me good? Well, since the man was talking about inheriting earning eternal life. Jesus spoke to him in his Jewish context and said, you know the commandments. And he cited, as we read them a while ago, he cites the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and then a do not defraud, which is a principle growing out of that. But he doesn't cite the 10th, do not covet. Well, the man gives a superficial response. It was sincere, but it was superficial. All, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. Now what he's saying as a Jew there, you need to understand this, when I was, when I was since the time I was bar mitzvahed, when, since the time that I became a young man of the community, the covenant community, I have been careful to keep the commandments. I visited with a woman years ago, decades ago now, I was talking with her about her relationship with God. She was a church member but didn't, didn't care anything about Loving the people of God, loving the Word, loving worshiping God with the people, none of that. And we were talking, and, and uh, she said to me at one point, I may be mistaken, but I don't think I've ever broken one of the Ten Commandments. I was in my 30s. I said, yes, ma'am, you're mistaken. <gasps> well, she was shocked that I would suggest she'd broken one of the Ten Commandments. I said, did your parents ever discipline you when you were growing up, ever spank you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, did they do that because they got a kick out of inflicting pain on you? Or because you were disobedient to them? You didn't honor your father and your mother. Here's the, here's the truth, folks. The Old Testament teaches if we break one commandment, we're guilty of all of them. We've broken them all in the sight of God. And it's superficial and naive to think that we're not guilty of the commandments. Well, I've never murdered anybody. That's typically what you hear from somebody. Really? Have you ever had a hateful attitude somebody, for somebody in your heart? Yeah? Well, Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, that's murder to him. Well, I've never committed adultery. Really? You ever lusted in your heart? <laughs> I'm a man, you know. Jesus said, that's adultery. You see, the commandments go a lot deeper into our psyche than we realize. Jesus puts this out to this man. What he should have done, by the way, is he should have gone, Oh, teacher, I'm undone. I'm guilty before the law. He didn't say that, though. All these I've kept from my youth. So Jesus issues him a sober challenge in verse 21. Jesus looked at him. Now let's, let's point out. There's not any indication in this exchange that Jesus was indignant with him. He was not. He was tender with him. 
Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Mark it down. Jesus loves sinners. As sinners. Even mistaken sinners. Even prideful sinners. Even sinners who are so superficial that they think somehow they've managed to keep the commandments. Jesus looked upon him and he loved him. And he said to him, this is the Bill Askell paraphrase now. There's one commandment I didn't mention. The tenth. You shall not covet. He didn't use those exact words, but that's where he's going here. You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have. And give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. Matthew records the episode this way. The man responds about the commandments. All these I've kept, what do I still lack? One commentator said, let's, let's give the man benefit of the doubt here that, that his certainty is not absolutely certain. I've kept all the commandments. Is, do, I, do I still lack anything? Is there anything missing? Jesus challenges him to liquidate his assets. We know from reading through the combined gospel accounts that he's wealthy, he's young, and he has authority. I want to say as an aside, if such a man were to come to a typical pastor today, he would be a member of the church in moments and on the fast track to becoming one of the leaders, probably a deacon. Young, powerful, rich. Think of how he could bless us. But Jesus didn't think that way. Jesus is looking for grace to bless those who need grace. One commentator said, it's shocking to hear Jesus say, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And the commentator said, but that's not the most critical thing he said to him. It's what came after that. And come, follow me. Follow me on my terms. Don't work me in to your life. I must be your life. Paul says, when Christ, who is our life, There's a book that I read years ago about discipleship. And there's a conversation that this author has on the discussion of the pearl of great price. One of Jesus' parables. And the man says to the pearl merchant, I want this pearl. How much is it? Well, the seller says, it's very expensive. But how much? Well, a very large amount. Do you think I could buy it? Of course. Everyone can buy it. But didn't you say it was very expensive? Yes. Well, how much is it? Everything you have, said the seller. All right, I'll buy it. Well, what do you have? Let's write it down. Well, I have $10,000 in the bank. The seller says, good. $10,000. What else? That's all. That's all I have. Nothing more? Well, I have a few dollars here in my pocket. How much? Well, let's see. There's 30, 40, 60, 80, 100, $120. Okay. What else do you have? Well, nothing. That's all. Well, where do you live? In my house. Yes, I have a house. The house too, then. I mean, I have to live in my camper? You have a camper? That too. What else? I'll have to sleep in my car. You have a car? Two of them. Both become mine. Both cars. What else? Well, you already have my money, my house, my camper, my cars. What more do you want? Are you alone in this world? 
No, I have a wife and two children. Oh, yes, your wife and children too. What else? I have nothing. I'm left alone. And the seller exclaims, oh, I almost forgot. You yourself too. Everything becomes mine. Wife, children, house, money, cars, and you too. And the seller says, now listen. I will allow you to use these things for the time being, but don't forget that they are mine, just as you are. And whenever I need any of them, you must give them up, because now I am the owner. That's what Jesus was saying. He wasn't trying to prove some nobility of poverty. Part of the man's dilemma is his Jewish mindset is taking in the teachings of the rabbis. And the rabbis said, when it comes to charity, give no more than one-fifth of everything you have because it would be awful to be cast into poverty. Well, we see in this response that it, it results in what we call a sorrowful departure. Verse 22 says, Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, his desire for eternal life was an add-on to his life. Something else he wanted. At an early age, he had achieved. He had wealth. He had power. Now he wanted to take care of his future. Just something else. I've talked to enough people through the years, and it's tragic when you run into somebody who thinks like this. One young man said to me, I'm, I'm young. I'll have plenty of time to think about that, the God thing later on in my life. I've got some things I want to do first. See, God is not interested in being made a part of your life or of my life. He does not need us. We need Him. And He is interested in our discovering that. That we need Him more than we need anything else. That I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. He's not here teaching about some, some religious notion that rich people are bad. What he's saying is that anything that stands in your way, anything that you cling to, that you cannot turn loose of to lay hold of Christ, then that is your idol. It may be money. It may be your security. It may be your children. It may be your grandchildren. Anything you're clinging to that you say, I cannot turn loose of this in order to have Him then you have an idol there. And you shall have, according to the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before Him. But the life that says, Lord, anything and everything I have has come from You. I, I live with open hands. You can have it all. Oh, that I may know You. That I may have Jesus. That I may be right with God. That I may have eternal life. A quality of life now. That Jesus describes in John 10, 10 as an abundant life. A life abundantly living in Him. Repenting of sin every day. Discovering sin in ourselves and repenting of it. Forgiving those who sin against us. Growing in faith and confidence in Jesus not being discouraged by our circumstances, but looking through them to believe that yet on the horizon there will be displays of the grace of God that I cannot even imagine or take in right now. Where are you? Whether you have little or have plenty, 
Where are you? What fills your, your screen? What fills your view? Your lenses? What thrills your soul? All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousands. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Jesus taught in Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Not your own that you think you bring to the issue. But the discovery that as Isaiah said, my, my righteousness, my good works are filthy rags compared to the holiness and the glory of God. And if I'm to have a relationship with God, it will not be based upon anything I have done, can do, will do, or have not done. It will be based upon a righteousness outside of myself, the righteousness of another, the Messiah whom God sent, Jesus, His only Son. That Jesus paid it all, and all to Him I owe. That's what Jesus is teaching. We've got to look outside of ourselves. Look to another. To the one who in, this, in, the, in the next episode here, he will teach again of his death, his coming death. That it must be the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in which we place all of our hope. So I know that I'm speaking to some who believe that. It is Jerry Bridges, by the way. Jerry Bridges just died last weekend. One of the great authors of our day. Jerry Bridges said, I never had a problem believing that somehow I could earn, that I could merit the grace of God in my life. He said, I knew it was pure grace, strictly upon what, who God is and what he had done for sinners. He said, here's where my problem came in, is after I was saved, I struggled with whether or not I could demerit the grace of God. If there was something I could do or fail to do that would somehow put me out of favor with God. It's in his book, Transforming Grace. Then I had to discover that, that there's not, not only can I not merit his grace, I cannot, as one of his followers, demerit his grace once I'm walking in Jesus. I know I'm speaking to somebody like that today. But somehow you, you're disappointed in your life, you're disappointed in your, in your zeal for, for him, and, The enemy of your soul is lying to you. Telling you you're out of favor with him. He doesn't love you like he used to love you because you haven't been faithful to him. And it's a lie. He loves us with an everlasting love. that does not change. It does not ebb and flow. Ours may ebb and flow toward him, but his does not ebb and flow toward us. I also know I'm speaking to some here today. Whether you ever admitted it to yourself or not, you're figuring that you're going to be okay with God based on who you are. And I'm here to tell you, you will not. But until you surrender to Jesus Christ, and all to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give, until you do that, you will live a deceived life and find in the end the awful consequences of your deceit. This story with this man ends badly. I've seen preachers try to turn it around and say, well, he probably took that to heart and came to... We don't have that notion. We don't have that indication in the Scripture. We leave him where he is. He walks away because he loved and valued something more than he valued Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord. There's some things that we see clearly that works righteousness is, is deadly, it's damnable. It, it, will, it will send us to hell if we cling to that mentality throughout our lives. But Lord, it's the subtle things. It's the subtle things for us. 
And I pray that you would bring us time and again, again and again, to the cross of Jesus Christ, to cling to the cross. Treasure the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ more than any treasure on this earth. To seek first his kingdom and, and believe the other things that are added to us, the, the privileges, the opportunities, the, the blessings, the material blessings that these things that are added to us are subservient to our being kingdom citizens and followers of Jesus. Speak to us today. Have your will in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Stand with me if you.